gold just passed $2,000 an ounce, setting the stage for a historic new bull run. Multiple billionaire investors are loading up on gold, including hedge fund founder Ray Dalio and real estate mogul Sam Zell, meaning now is the time to own gold. One precious metals expert is stepping forward with a big prediction. He believes we could see gold reach as high as $3,000 by the end of the year, possibly higher. So find out why and get instant access to his number one gold investment for 2022. It's not bullion, an ETF, or a mining stock. In the past, folks using the same gold strategy could have been able to make nearly 50 times their initial investment. Considering how quickly the price of gold has been moving, you don't want to waste any time missing out on the gains he believes are in store for this investment. So to get a copy of his new free report with all the details, simply go to 2022goldmania.com. Again, that's 2022goldmania.com for a free copy of his new report. All right, we are back with Jim Rickards, part two of our discussion that will be focused on inflation, the Fed, and what's coming next. Uh, we all saw the headlines by now that the consumer price index for February rose uh, by 7.9% from a year ago. That's the highest uh, level since 1982. Here to talk about uh, where we are at with inflation, Jim Rickards, back with us, Jim. Uh, thanks for, uh, for, for joining us for part two here. Sure thing. So I have to bring up the last time you were on, Jim, uh, you, you took a lot of heat for a comment uh, that you made that we had reached peak inflation. This was back in de December. So it's clear now that the inflation train is, is still rolling forward here. Have you have you changed your stance since? Uh, yes, it's, uh, like I say, you're, uh, you're entitled to your own opinions, but you're not entitled to your own facts. And the facts are that inflation has, has played out uh, longer than I expected and exactly the way you described uh, one point that I would make is that um, when you say this is the highest inflation in, uh, since 1982, 40 years basically, that's true. But the inflation in 1982 that we're comparing it to was the end of the inflation. Uh, it started really in a severe form around 1976. And so by 1982, it had come down to 7.5% or thereabouts. So you're right about those numbers. But it, it was up to 15% in 1980. So 7.9 or whatever the last number was um, uh, for, in terms of the monthly inflation figures, yeah, that's pretty bad. But don't think it can't go a lot higher. It can. Um, what I expected, uh, and I, I still expect this. I, let me put it this way. I still expect this, but I pushed out the time horizon because you know a lot has happened and, and we have more data. Um, there are two kinds of inflation. Um, and one is uh, what they call uh, cost push inflation. The other one is demand pull inflation. Those are you know economic jargon. But demand pull is most driven by the consumers, the the everyday American or you know, everyday person around the world. They they see some inflation. They go ask the boss for a raise. They go, I, I need more money to keep up. They accelerate purchases. Like oh, gee, if that refrigerator is going to be more expensive three months from now, maybe I better buy it today before the price goes up, it kind of feeds on itself, but it's very much driven by consumer behavior, the, the, the behavior of labor and working people uh, trying to keep ahead of something that they're living through. Uh, so that's demand pull. The other kind of inflation is called cost push. That comes from the supply side. That basically is uh, you know, an oil embargo or a war in Ukraine or uh, economic sanctions or supply chain disruption. Uh, there could be a lot of causes or multiple causes but basically, it's not that the consumer has so much changed his or her perspective, but they can't get stuff or the, the suppliers are raising the prices because, hey, our input prices are higher, so we have to raise the prices to consumers. The, there, now, you can have both. One can feed, you, it can start as sort of cost push, meaning it starts with supply chain disruption, comes from the supply side, but then the consumers say, hey, no mas, you know, enough, I want to raise, and so it can feed on itself. The reason I make that distinction is because the Fed can possibly do something about um, about the demand side. The Fed can, you know, squash it by raising interest rates and raising mortgage rates and deflating asset values, et cetera. The Fed can't do anything about oil. The Fed can't do anything about the supply side. They they let, maybe people think they can, but they but they can't. Uh, and that was what we saw. That was how it started in the 1970s. It started with the Arab oil embargo which went through two separate phases, uh, one with the Arab-Israeli war and then later with, um, with Iran. Uh, we had two separate you know, periods of spiking uh, gas prices and gas lines in 1974, again in 1979. 
But that started from a supply side that the Fed couldn't do anything about, although the Fed probably was too easy at the start of it. So right now, this inflation um, has come from the supply side. Now, how will it play out on the demand side? That's the question. That's interesting because I, I had one professor of applied economics on saying, look, this inflation has nothing to do uh, with you know broken supply chains, et cetera. It, it solely has to do with, uh, with uh, money, money supply and the surplus of it. Um, so would you say not so to that? Was that Professor Hankey or? Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, I know Steve. He's, I'm, I'm, uh, I have two uh, degrees from Johns Hopkins, so he's um, very much a, yeah, Steve, ha- Steve is, is brilliant, uh, great on foreign currency, great on currency boards and a lot of other things. I completely disagree with that description, and I'll, I'll tell you why, and I've said this before. Uh, the Fed has exploded the money supply, so there's no question about that. M0 has, uh, well, gone up by... 400%. The Fed's trying to rein it in a little bit. But when you go from $800 billion in 2008 to $4.3 trillion, trillion in uh, 2013 when they started the taper to um, $7 or $8 trillion, which is where it was after the pandemic in uh, the spring of 2020, uh, there's no question about the money printing. But that money doesn't go anywhere. It doesn't do anything. It's uh, basically the Fed expands M0 by buying bonds from the banks. They take the bonds on the portfolio. They give the money to the banks. Money comes out of thin air. But the banks just give it back to the Fed as a deposit in the form of excess reserves. So you're inflating the liability side, which are the excess reserves, and the asset side, which are the bonds. You've inflated your balance sheet. You've increased M0. But you haven't done one thing for the economy. There's nothing about what I just described that goes into the real economy. Now, where does money for the real economy come from? It comes from commercial banks lending and consumers spending, and that shows up in velocity. And if you look at the velocity statistics, they've crashed in the last 10 years and they're still going down. So the reason so-called money printing doesn't turn into inflation is because the money doesn't go anywhere. Okay, so before uh, we look at how the Fed plans to tackle inflation, just to be clear on where, where you're at, you're, you're saying now, Okay, it's not peak. You see it headed higher uh, and lasting for, for how long? What's your, what's your current thesis here? Okay, well, and to well, what level? Okay, well, that's why, great question. That's why I spent time on the, on the supply ch- side versus the demand side because the, the demand side isn't really there yet. Velocity is not going up. People are noticing. I mean, they, they notice it has a huge political impact, but it's coming from the supply ch- side. And I... I spent a lot of time studying the supply chain, so I could see that. But then the the war in Ukraine and the sanctions were like uh, putting a turbocharger on. Okay, it's, right. it's worse and it's going to get worse. Okay, so how does that reverse? How does that turn into disinflation and finally deflation? The answer is there's a feedback loop. When 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 price at the pump, of well, course, so gas prices are going up. We all know that they they practically doubled, more than doubled. Um, it, but people need to drive. Uh, there's some discretion, but you kind of you got to get to work. You got to visit the relatives. You're, you're out there driving, so you don't have much choice about it. You just have to pay it. But that reduces your discretionary income. It means you're not going to buy something else. You're not going to go out to dinner. You're not going to buy a, a present. You're not going to buy a new TV set. There's some other thing that you're not going to buy because you had to spend more at the pump, and, and that would not be true. If real wages are going up, real wages are not going up. So at monthly, we get the employment report, and it's been showing that um, you know, real wages went up, or sorry, um, wages went up, let's say 5% uh, on a year-over-year basis. And that that's about what they've been going up. And everyone say, look, wages are going up. No, because that's 5% nominal. But we have, we just said, we have 7.5% inflation. So when you subtract the inflation from the nominal, real wages are negative. They're going down. Uh, so price at the pump is going up. Real wages are going down. People are miserable about that. But the only way they can deal with it, even though Bloomberg said eat lentils, I mean, that was <laughs> let them eat cake, right? Uh, that was one of the most ridiculous columns I've ever seen. Take the bus and eat lentils instead of uh, hamburgers. But um, that kind of lunacy aside, the way people adjust in the real world is they stop spending on something else. So that can slow the economy. We're seeing it already. Atlanta Fed GDP numbers have been quite low. We're, I'm not forecasting a recession, but it wouldn't surprise me. We're seeing, okay. yield, curve, we're seeing yield curve inversion, not just in the yeah. Treasury yield curve, but look in the euro dollar futures yield curve in the, uh, um, in the reds, actually, which are not that far out. That should never be inverted. 
That's like so, that's like one of the clearest signs of a recession you can find. You, you just beat me to the question about recession. I was going to say, so do you think that the Fed will be able to orchestrate this soft landing without triggering the recession? Well, no, and they failed before. We, we've seen this movie. Remember, they tried to do this starting in 2013. That's when Bernanke announced the taper and everything fell apart, so they delayed it, but they started the taper in, uh, I think, November 2013. They finished the taper in November 2014, Janet Yellen waited until December 2015 to raise rates just 25 basis points and waited another year to December 2016 to raise them again. Then it was handed off to, to Powell. And then he began a steady uh, uh, state of rate increases, basically 25 basis points at every meeting. He got rates up to two and a quarter percent and he got the balance sheet down from about four and a half trillion to like 3.6 trillion over the course of 2017, 2018. What happened next? October 1st to December 24th, 2018, the stock market crashed 20%. That's because, and, and then what, if, what did Jay Powell do? He stopped rate hikes. He um, stopped, he started a new taper, a new QE, QE6 or whatever at that point, and he cut rates. And then we went right into the pandemic and rates are back to zero and the balance sheet tripled. So he failed uh, and the stock market crashed in the process. So now we're doing it again. But Wall Street, it's not going to take as long to play out because Wall Street has seen this movie before. So, so here's the thing. This is your question. Can the Fed normalize interest rates, which I would call about 2.5%, and normalize the balance sheet, which I would call around $3 trillion, without causing a recession or a stock market crash or both? The answer is no. But the problem with the Fed is they're usually the last to know. Like I just told you, you get it. The, the, list, the viewers get it. But Jay Powell will be like the last one other than some of the other governors, to understand what we just said. And so um, we'll probably get the recession and the crash before the Fed gets the wake-up call. But no, they can't do it. Okay, okay. So I just want to clarify, because I thought you said you didn't think we'd see a recession, but you, I'm but not, you think... Well, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not, as of this minute, based on all the information okay. we have, it's hard to predict, although it's very likely. We're seeing a lot of signs that that could be true. But... As the Fed goes down this path, uh, which they are they not only said they're going to do, but Jay Powell up the ante the other day said, we might do 50 yeah. basis points, okay? Yeah. They yeah. go down that path, then they will cause a recession. That will absolutely happen. But whether it's late this year, early next year, or you know, it could be sooner based on... See, now, here's where it gets a little more complicated because uh, the, the economy, the global economy and the U.S. economy would be slowing drastically anyway because of the sanctions and the economic war with Russia and, you know, energy shortages. So that would be happening anyway. The Fed has got um, a quadruple tightening exercise going on. So they just tapered. So that's one. They just raised rates. That's two. Um, they previewed the fact that they might actually reduce the balance sheet. That's quantitative tightening or QT. That's three. And then in the last dot plot, even though the dots are kind of a joke, um, said that they would probably that they would uh, have more rate hikes sooner than people expected. So that's a quadruple tightening. Uh, tapers over, QE is about to begin, rates are going up, and they may be going up for a long time. That's a recipe for a recession. And on the stock market front, I mean, we already see what's happening in the Nasdaq to tech stocks. Um, what kind of crash are we looking at or talking about? Well, um, stock market crashes tend to happen very quickly. Uh, they're, they're slower in the bond market and you know, global recessions build kind of slowly and global liquidity crisis, they, they seem to happen very quickly and they do, but they build for a while. And so we're seeing all this thing. Stock market kind of is, the, is almost the last to know. And, but, they, but one day the stock market wakes up and says, oh, gee, uh, you know, growth is zero, recession's looming, the war's continuing. The sanctions are getting worse. The supply chain is busted. I guess we better reprice. And you can go down 20% in a matter of weeks. A matter of weeks. Um, oh, yeah. Well we, we saw, well, we saw that. In, that happened in yep. March 2020. I guess um, as a final point here, Jim, I want to bring up talk of uh, the digital currency, the Fed dollar, call it whatever you want to call it. Um, obviously, we see the mandates coming out, uh, Biden talking about it, and now um, Powell 
uh, commenting on, on a future central bank digital currency, saying that, you know, should we see one, it would need to ensure user privacy. It would need to be identity verifiable. Um, it would need to be intermediated and serve as a widely accepted means of payment. Okay, but I want to hone in on the ensure user privacy part because when we talk about the coming, uh, you know, digital dollar, obviously the question of privacy is like, well, what about my privacy? So can you have a digital dollar that ensures a user's privacy? Does that make sense to you? Is that no. plausible? Okay. <laughs> well, all right. It, 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 it needs a little bit, of, there's a little bit of nuance there. So they can ensure your privacy vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world. So Danielle, Danielle Cambon has her, um, her digital wallet. I don't know if you have iPhone or Samsung, but you know you got your smartphone, you got your app, your Fed app. You have an account at the Fed. It's completely digital. You're getting um, the central bank digital currency in the form of U.S. dollar, et cetera, and you're paying your bills, and life goes on. They can protect that against the rest of the world, but they know it. The government knows it, and that's part of the total surveillance state, and that's the way it's being rolled out in China. So it's really a totalitarian mechanism. So, I mean, they already know you where I don't have to pick on you, me, or anybody. They know our whereabouts <laughs> from, our, from our iPhones when they're on. Unless you get a, I have a Faraday bag, turn it off, put it in a Faraday bag, that's pretty good protection. But if you don't have that, they're, they're following you around. But now they're going to every point of purchase, what did you buy? And getting back to our friend Christy Freeland, so what if you voted for the wrong political party or supported the mm -hmm. wrong political cause? And they freeze your account, you know? So... It may be private to the rest of the world, but it's not private to the government. In fact, quite the opposite. It perfects the total surveillance state. So it's 1984. And um, just want to bring up cryptos. I, I know you haven't embraced them in the past, but I saw you recently on a new crypto uh, talk show oh, yeah. on Bloomberg. Uh, so is, are you are you are you have a change of heart there on, on the crypto front, Jim? Or? Uh, not really. I, here's what I would say, and uh, uh, I wasn't going to mention the competition, but yeah, I was on, on Bloomberg's new crypto show, and um, they they were very ni nice to invite. I me. embraced the competition, so it's all good. <laughs> yeah, exactly, because we all bring up yeah. our game when we have tough competition. Yeah. That's a good point. So, um, I've been studying crypto closely since almost the time it came out, and part of the reason is I get constantly invited to these gold versus crypto debates and you had the most yeah. famous one in history thank you uh, i was i was on the sidelines a little bit but frank justra and uh, michael saylor um and, and they're fun and i participate in them i take them seriously but to me it's, it's a little bit like fish and bicycles i mean they're just they're just really different um but uh but i've been struggling, researching, doing work, et cetera, trying to really understand. I know all the technical stuff. I get the algorithms. I get the, the caps and I know how the mining works and the, the, the hash rate and, uh, uh, I, I, you know, the price action and the technicals. And I get all that. None of that has anything to do with Bitcoin or any other cryptocurrency. Uh, the, the right way to think about it or the most advanced way to think about it is part of an electronic environment that we're all immersed in that we're not aware of because we're in it. It's, you know, I've, I've said uh, we don't know who discovered water, but it was it was not a fish, meaning if you're if the fish is in the water, it doesn't know what water is. You have to you have to take it out of the water. It's like, hey, where's the water? So um, so we're in this environment, all of us. Um, and this is having effects on how we think how our brain processes information. So the point I was making, and, and this has taken me a long time to get here because I've done a ton of research, but it's not that everyone's like, oh, the Bitcoin's going to, Bitcoin's going to take down the dollar. Bitcoin's the end of the dollar. No, Bitcoin is part of a larger electronic digital environment that we're all in that has erased the concept of money. We've lost the thread. We actually don't know what money is anymore. We pretend that we do. We talk so about well it. So well said, yeah. We, we yep. don't know. And so I'm using the term moneyness. It has some characteristics of money. Some do, some don't. Some have more, some have less. Some have different features. And I, there's a, a really good piece of academic research, uh, fairly recent. But the authors kind of want to update the classic definition of money. That was their point. And this is from uh, Jevin and um, uh, Menger in the late 19th century. And they were the ones who said, you know, unit of account, store of value, medium of exchange. That's the three-part definition of money. And everyone recites it, and I've recited it. 
And they said, well, yeah, but you actually have a lot more different kinds of money and you have a lot more functions. And they listed uh, 40 separate characteristics. So yeah, medium of exchange, unit of account, sure. But you know, good or bad for money laundering, good or bad for tax collection, good or bad for privacy, or maybe put differently, does it offer privacy or not? Does it help tax collection or not? Does it help any money laundering or not? Down this list of 40 characteristics, and they had 15 kinds of money. So, uh, you know, Fed money, the central bank digital currencies, Bitcoin, crypto, gold, silver, et cetera, and, and a bunch of others. So that's a matrix with 600 boxes, you know, 40 characteristics, 15 kinds of money. And you, and they checked every box. It does it or does it not have it. So it's like a Chinese menu. You know, you can sit there and cook up your own kind of money. So I thought it was really good scholarship and a great way to think about it. But taking that a step further to my point, if I've got 600 choices on the matrix, then we don't actually know what money is. What we have is, is a, what I call moneyness. Um, and that has much bigger implications than whether, you know, Bitcoin is a bigger payment currency than the dollar someday. I personally doubt it. But, but, but what's going on is actually much more profound. Interesting. Interesting. Well, I um, appreciate your open mind always. <laughs> Well, we, you, you have to you just have to keep learning new stuff. That's how I think about it. Keep Thank learning. you. Keep learning. That's it. Absolutely. Uh, Jim, I, I always appreciate you and your time. Uh, thank you so much for this great, uh, great conversation here today. Thank you. Thanks. And thank you all for watching. We'll have much more coming your way. So be sure to stay tuned to Stansberry Research. And don't forget to sign up for premier content at DanielaCombone.com. That's it for me. Thanks for watching. Opinions expressed on this program are solely those of the contributor and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Stansbury Research, its parent company, or affiliates.